first of all, it is going to be necessary that our talk be informal so that the relationship between us can be that of friends. This is very important. It is more important than anything else that takes place tonight, and you will soon understand the reason for it. <clears throat> and so first of all, may we greet each other with a good evening. Thank you. Probably one of the great privileges and honors that we receive is to be invited into homes as a guest. That honor comes to me frequently, and I know that it does to you. When we enter a home as a guest, there is a code of conduct expected of us as guests. In the same way, I feel myself to be a guest in South Africa. I feel myself to be a guest in Johannesburg, certainly a guest in your individual consciousness. You have invited me into your mental home, into your consciousness, and uh, I would like to assure you that I come into your awareness as a guest well aware of the code of conduct that governs guests and hosts and hostesses. In other words, I come to bring friendship, to bring uh, confidence, to bring cooperation, to bring as much joy as possible, but above all things to give no offense. And I ask you to bear with me on that latter statement, because in a meeting of this kind, it may be a very simple thing for some to take offense at some of the things that I may say. Be assured no offense is intended. Be assured of this that I speak without criticism or judgment or condemnation of any religious or philosophical or metaphysical teaching. And yet what I have to say differs from many of these and in some measure from all of these. And yet in differing, I differ without any intention of saying better or worse. In other words, I would like to present to you as briefly as possible a summary of the major principles of the infinite way. In doing that, I recognize this, that many of you have been students of metaphysical religions or philosophical approaches to life or even orthodox religious beliefs, convictions, and uh, you will find many points of difference even to the degree of direct opposites. And yet I ask you to believe that I am not saying to you that this of the infinite way is correct and what you have known as incorrect, 
I come to say to you only that the principles of the infinite way as I present them to you are the proven demonstrable principles that have evolved in my life over a very long period of time and have proven demonstrable and efficacious in my own life and in the life of hundreds of students. And so I present it to you in that light. Now, let us see this for just a moment. There are three planes of existence that we know about at this present time. The physical plane of life, the mental plane, and the spiritual. The physical and the mental are embraced in the three-dimensional life. The spiritual is the fourth-dimensional. Now, on the level of physical life, there are certain laws, laws of food, laws of diet, laws of exercise, laws of uh, medicines. Oh, there are so many laws that come into our experience on the physical plane of life. And if we are living on that plane, we had better be obedient to these laws or we will get into trouble. In other words, if a person living on the physical plane of life were to try to live that life sitting in a chair, they would soon find themselves losing the use of many parts or functions of their bodies. And so, for their own sake it were well if they observed some of the dietetic laws laws of exercise, laws of fresh air, and so forth and so on. Now, there is a higher plane than that, and that is the mental plane. And uh, on this plane, we have the Master, Christ Jesus, saying that not only is the act of adultery wrong, a sin, but the very thought of it, the very looking with lust, in other words, a mental activity, is as much an error of life as the physical act itself. That seems strange to many people, that they can be punished for their thoughts, when uh, their deeds have not been wrong, and yet on the mental plane it is that way. Now, on this mental plane there are mental causes for physical conditions, and a whole science has sprung up in the world called mental science based on that very premise. that. This was originally not a Materia Medica premise. Originally, this was a metaphysical premise. In the beginning, doctors did not agree with this, but the premise was this, that if you worried, you got ulcers. And if you were jealous, envious, or hateful, you might get a cancer. If you were resentful, so forth and so on, you might get rheumatism. <clears throat> and so an entire metaphysical practice grew up dedicated to the idea that if it could be discovered what your mental fault was, that your physical ills could be cured. <clears throat> Now, later on, some forms of Materia Medica adopted that very premise, and it has become the basis of 
some psychological practice and some psychiatric practice. In other words, <clears throat> some mental activity within you would be responsible for some physical disorder in your experience. <clears throat> now, human life today all over the world has very nearly accepted that premise for its entire existence. And so in our school systems, hospitals, mental institutes, we find Materia Medica doing very much the same as many metaphysical practitioners, first trying to find the error in your thought and thereby removing the effects from your body. Now I say this to you, that on the physical plane, if you are living it, it would be well to follow the laws of matter and uh, by obedience to them benefit to whatever degree is possible. And if you have in some measure transcended the physical plane to where you have been able to accept this mental life, it would be well if you watched your thoughts and if you found yourself indulging envy, hate, jealousy, malice, greed, envy, lust, that you uh, try to overcome such thoughts and uh, mold yourself on uh, a higher plane of consciousness. And so I point out to you that some of you may be following rigidly the physical way of life, others may be following this part physical and mostly mental approach to life. And so you may disagree with what I present to you of the message of the infinite way. If you do, let us disagree as friends, because each of us must have the right in this modern age to follow our wisdom from within as we are led. I will not say of the physical plane or the mental plane that these are wrong, and so I will ask you until you have had experience not to believe that the spiritual plane is wrong or that it is impractical. The message of the infinite way is primarily a spiritual one. And uh, in taking its position on the spiritual plane of life, it drops many of those things and thoughts that were important on the physical and mental level and yet seems to lose nothing of this world's goods. I will illustrate that for you in this way. On the physical plane of life, one works hard physically to earn their daily bread, very often by the sweat of the brow. On the mental plane, one uses far less of muscle and bodily might, but they engage more in mental activities, not only the mental activities that concern their particular positions or activities or professions in life, but even mental forms of prayer to enhance the prosperity of their activity. On the spiritual plane, that changes. 
and it changes for this reason, that on the spiritual plane of life it isn't necessary to earn a living. It isn't necessary to work for a living. It isn't even necessary to do anything about having a living. Sounds very ideal, doesn't it? Quite a, an advance. But don't be fooled by it. When you come to the spiritual way of life, you find you work, you work harder than you ever did on the physical or the mental. Only now you are not working for a living. Now you are working because something has been given to you to do of a nature that you must do and your living comes in as an incidental to your work. In other words, you are now beginning to approach that place in life spoken of by the same Master, Christ Jesus, when he said, take no thought for your life. What you shall eat or what you shall drink Take no thought. He tells us very clearly that the nations of the world, that is the people of the physical and the mental realm, take thought for these things, but not ye. You must not take thought for what you shall eat or what you shall drink or wherewithal you shall be clothed. You must take thought only for the things of God. You must take thought only for the revelation or realization of God and what you shall eat and drink and be clothed with will be added unto you. There you see we enter quite a different uh, degree of consciousness because now we are not seeking physically or mentally for anything of this life, not supply, not companionship, not home, not happiness, not peace, not joy, not security. Now we are seeking only the realization of God and then finding that in the attaining of it all of these things are added unto us. It is a surprising thing that the world in this 20th century is busy seeking safety and security and peace, as if 20 centuries and the centuries that went before the era of the Master weren't enough to convince us that the finding of safety, security, and peace is an utter impossibility. It never, those things never have been found since the world began. And those things are never going to be found. There is no such thing in all of this world as safety, security, or peace. And the reason is, as men and women on the physical or mental plane of life, there will always be found the two opposing or conflicting powers called good and evil. There will be good humans and there will be bad humans. And as long as you have that combination, the bad ones will be trying to benefit at the expense of the good ones and the good ones will have to fight back to protect themselves from the bad ones. And so as long as you have good men and women and bad men and women, you are going to have uh, war. You are going to have a lack of security. You are going to have a lack of safety. In uh, the little place where I have my home, when I first went there, a friend turned over an apartment 
her apartment for my use in her absence. And uh, as she turned it over to me, she said, Oh, oh, I forgot. You, you might want a key to lock the door. I don't know. Isn't it usual? Oh, no, I haven't seen my keys for several years. I don't know where they are. That was the situation there then that people found it unnecessary to lock their doors. As a matter of fact, it would have been kind of foolish because all of our windows are open. We only have screens. The locked door and an open screen uh, just do not make sense, do they? And so it became the habit to leave the doors open and to leave the screens open. And why? Why? Well, the main reason is that the original Hawaiian people were, and still are, a race of people that have no interest in the things of this world. And they wouldn't go to the trouble of stealing anything. They wouldn't even go to the trouble of working to earn it. And they just don't like work. They can sleep right alongside of the biggest job and rest happily. So they are not a bit interested in money. They know that the ocean is stocked with fish and you can get all you want of those for nothing. And out in the backyard they plant their, it's a root called poi, and they dig that up and mash it. And that costs relatively nothing. And uh, so their food requirements are not to be thought of in terms of money. Their housing is the same. Originally, they had grass shacks, but nobody slept inside of them. They slept outside. They only went inside in the heat of the day to get outside of the sun. And so you see that housing wasn't an expense. And clothing, well, we uh, always have 70 to 80 degree temperature there, so clothing is no problem. You can get along without it beautifully. So the Hawaiian never had any occasion to think in terms of dishonesty. And as other populations moved in, they took on that same aspect. Today we have a population of 60% Japanese. And of course, with their natures, one hardly ever dreams of such a thing as locking a door or hiding anything for fear that it might be stolen. And so you see that in our primitive estate, there was no need for this safety and security. Everybody automatically had it by virtue of their nature. That is, the nature of not desiring what the other fellow had. Now, in a complex society as we have it today, based on a, a different economic setup, that condition hardly exists on earth. And so we have locks and safe deposit vaults and all the rest of those things that represent safety and security. And then we have our police departments and our courts and our armies and navies, and these are supposed to represent peace. But do they? Have they ever? Has all the police departments and all the history of the world maintained honesty in a city? No, at best they have caught the culprits and imprisoned them but they haven't made the population honest. And so it is that every attempt that the world has made from the beginning of time right up to the most modern uh, thoughts like Leagues of Nations and uh, United Nations, all of these have failed, always will fail, because of human interest. And human interest is always opposed to each other. It always will be. Now, let us follow this for just a minute. 
here you have a human race partly good and partly evil those who are good definitely want safety security and peace and are willing for all men and all women on earth to have it but the evil ones on earth won't permit it you know from your experience as i know from mine there never has been a people on earth who wanted wars always it was the minority of evil ones that brought the great majority of good ones into these conflicts now then is there an answer to all of this and from our standpoint in the message of the infinite way there is no answer on the human plane there is an answer on the spiritual plane and for this we have to go back to scripture you will find beginning in uh, the old testament this is one occasion when the hebrews were in a very bad fix the enemy was stronger than they they rushed to their spiritual leaders and told them the enemy are stronger than we are they have multitudes they have hordes the spiritual leader replied have no fear have no fear our enemy has only the arm of flesh we have the Lord God Almighty remember this our enemy has hordes multitudes weapons but a religious leader says they have only the arm of flesh physical might physical power we have the Lord God Almighty he might have continued that and said that in the presence of the Lord God Almighty the arm of flesh is not a power because a short time after he demonstrated that when the enemy used their arms to fight each other and wiped each other out destroyed each other now later David found himself in a similar position when uh, Goliath had all of this heavy armor was encased in it and in addition to the heavy defensive armor he has a an offense weapon they tried to put a coat of mail on David and he said no oh no I do not need this material armor because I go out clad in God God is my defense and he went out against this mighty armor and this mighty weapon with nothing but an insignificant pebble and he mastered the situation with this insignificant pebble later Christ Jesus was faced with a blind man now you all know what a terrible power blindness is in human sense but to that master with his spiritual vision and wisdom he thought so little of the power of blindness that he took the most insignificant thing that was known to the Hebrew race he took spittle which is an emblem of disdain of nothingness and uh, heal the blind man with spittle with nothingness with that which is no power that which no Hebrew would honor as worthy of anything in fact they use it as an emblem of disdain and of nothingness and so with this nothingness 
The master heals that terrible power of blindness. Now that is what we approach in the spiritual plane of life, where anything and everything that you have given power to on the material or mental plane you now turn upon with as much indifference as you would uh, entertain to a pebble or spittle and say, you are no power, because in the presence of God there is but one power. Not one power that overcomes error, no, no, no. One power alone in the presence of which there is no form of error, no weapon that can be formed against you can prosper. And the whole secret lies in this realization, the seeking of the kingdom of God in the presence of which nothing else is power. And so in this message of the infinite way, there is never a turning to God for the overcoming of sin, disease, or lack. Now will you bear with me in that? Let me repeat that. In the message of the infinite way, there is never a turning to God for the overcoming of sin, disease, death, lack, or limitation. There is a turning to God continually merely for the purpose of living and moving and having our being in God. And in that consciousness, regardless of the strength of the enemy, it is nothing but an arm of flesh. It is a nothingness. It is a no power. It is a no law, a no cause. Now on this point, you have one of the major principles that brought about the writing of the book, The Infinite Way. I had witnessed so many attempts to overcome error, to use right thinking to overcome wrong thinking, and I found even in my own experience that nothing that I could do in the way of right thinking would overcome my wrong thinking because something within me was predisposed toward wrong thinking. And no willpower would change that. Only when the realization finally came that I need no power to remove these errors, these sins, discords, inharmonies, I need but one thing. If I can come into the presence of the living God, if I can attain an awareness of God, an actual conscious communion with God, then I will be in the presence of that which is itself infinite, eternal, immortal, and besides which there is nothing else. And so it proved to be. And again, Scripture says, Lean not unto thine own understanding. Acknowledge him in all thy ways, and he will direct thy paths. Paul tells us, pray without ceasing. There are dozens of passages in Scripture that prove, or rather reveal to us so that we may prove, that a realization of God leaves one in a world without sin, disease, death, lack, or limitation. The Master, Christ Jesus, gave us the outstanding teaching on that very point in the 15th chapter of John. You probably are aware of the fact that it is said that we do not know where sin and sickness comes from, that it has never been discovered why 
sin and sickness, disease, poverty can touch us. Oh, there are teachings to the effect that if you sin, those things can happen to you. But you know, most of the people on earth aren't sinners. Most of them are as we are, moderately good people, moderately mo moral people, in no wise bad enough to deserve the horrors that have been visited upon us in every generation. No one has the right to say that you and I are so evil that we deserve plagues of polio or hydrogen bombs thrown at us or concentration camps. None of us are that evil, not even humanly. Why is it then that there is the problem of human discord that the world fights from the cradle to the grave. Why is it that innocent children are born into this world with afflictions? Why is it that innocent young mothers suffer and sometimes die in the very act of giving birth? Why all this? And the world has no answer for it. The world has no answer except to say that we do not know the answer to that. But actually, the Master Christ Jesus gave us an answer. Specifically, he gave us an answer as to why we are having discords. And he gave us that answer in the 15th chapter of John. He said, if you abide in this word, and if you let this word abide in you, none of these things will happen to you. You will bear fruit richly because it is your Father's will that you bear fruit richly. It is your Father's will and pleasure that you prosper in all ways. But, he says, if you do not abide in this word, and if you do not let this word abide in you, you will be as a branch that withereth, a branch that is cut off and withereth. Now remember, he had come to that through this. He starts out with saying that you are the branches. Christ is the vine, God is the Father, the source, the essence. Now he says that if the branches abide in the vine, and the vine is one with its source, then all harmony flows. Now as I'm talking, visualize, will you? A tree, will you see the branches on a tree all connected with the uh, the central trunk, let us call that the vine, and then realize down below the ground the root which is in contact with the whole earth. And now see that as long as the branches on the tree are at one with the vine, the trunk, and that trunk is established in the earth, that that tree will bear fruit richly because through the roots and the trunk, the elements and substances necessary to the formation of the fruits will be distributed, and in due time the fruitage will appear. Now let us cut the uh, branch right off of the trunk, lay it on the ground, and see what happens in a very short while. For a short while it keeps on living. It's living on the substance that is already within itself. But remember, it is not being renewed day by day. It is using itself up. And so in time, it withers. It bears no more fruit. And so with us. If we are human beings, 
we may live our human span of three score years and ten, or it may be ten less, or it may be ten more, and uh, you will find that we have used up the little life with which we started and a little more that we added through our food and drink, but the end was a withering up and a dying, and more especially looking back on our lives and say, why was I born? Why did I come to earth? What have I ever done that repaid my mother's birth pangs? And the answer in most cases is, I haven't contributed much to the world. I haven't done much to justify my existence on earth. That has never yet been said by any saint or seer or prophet or savior who came to the re realization that by living in God, he was eternally fed by that hidden spring, that hidden well of water, fed by that meat of which Christ Jesus spoke. I have meat that ye know not of. I have water. If you ask me, I can give you living waters, waters that spring up into life eternal. I am the bread of life. In other words, the Master revealed a substance which he called meat, wine, water, bread, but which was not physical. You know it wasn't physical because you know that when he said, I am the bread of life, he wasn't talking about a baker's loaf of bread because he never was that. And you know when he said uh, that I have meat ye know not of, he was not talking of a carcass. He had no hidden carcass about him, animal flesh. When he spoke of bread and meat and wine and water, this inner water that springs up into life eternal, he was telling us of a spiritual source of supply, a spiritual source of life, a spiritual source of substance and activity, having which you had everything on the outer plane. Our work in the message of the infinite way is devoted to that principle. It says that I have within my being that which may be called the bread, the wine, the water, but which we will call the Christ. That as a branch, I am at one with the Christ, the Son of God, at the center of my being. It, in turn, is always one with the Father. I and the Father are one. And all that the Father hath belongs to this I, this Christ, this spiritual center of my being and of yours. Therefore, I turn time and time again during the day and night to this secret center of my being. And there I acknowledge God to be the source of that meat, wine, water, and bread. I acknowledge God to be the temple, the very temple of my being. I acknowledge God to be the life, the soul, the spirit, the animating principle. I acknowledge that the entire kingdom of God is active in my consciousness and uh, that it is appearing outwardly as the happiness, the joy, the success, the supply, the home, the allness of my daily experience. Now the moment that I do that, I no longer have to take anxious thought for my living, nor do I have to worry about a home or companionship or safety 
or security or peace because having found this center of being to be God I carry with me my peace there is no peace external to me the peace is within me and I express it to you if I express it to you the reflex action is a coming back of peace to me if I express love justice kindness mercy to you it is inevitable that it reflects itself back to me but I first must let it flow from me I first must acknowledge that all of this is within me now not by virtue of Joel's greatness not by virtue of Joel's understanding not by virtue of Joel's spirituality oh no by virtue of the truth that as a branch I am one with the vine and the vine is one with God and uh, we three are one God the Father God the Son God the Holy Ghost and in that oneness the Spirit of God flows forth and appears on earth as the harmonies of our being you see peace can only come in your consciousness and in mine it cannot come from outside somewhere to make peace here we are a group of people in this room there is nothing in this room that will bring peace or give peace except what you are entertaining in consciousness there is nothing in this room that could start a war except whatever it is that you may bring in your consciousness and so therefore there is no use ever to look outside of ourselves for peace for safety or security because we will not find them you bring them to this room and you will find them here you bring to this room an awareness of God's presence and the 91st Psalm will be demonstrated no evil will come nigh thy dwelling place and right there you might say ah but I have seen a lot of evil come nigh my dwelling place or somebody else's dwelling place ah yes but you forgot the very first verse of the 91st Psalm which says he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high none of these things will come nigh his dwelling place the 91st Psalm doesn't pr does not promise that we will have protection as human beings it promises us protection in the degree that we abide in the secret place of the Most High and so does the Master Christ Jesus he promises us that we will bear fruit richly only if we abide in the word and if we let the word abide in us and do you not see now that so far as we are concerned in the message of the infinite way the peace and harmony of your life is dependent upon an activity of your own consciousness there is no God outside who can give you peace safety and security if you are violating its laws nor are there any legal laws nor any national or international laws that can save you from any violation of spiritual law and so we come in this work to this place where the harmony of my individual life must be somehow found by me within me as an activity of my consciousness as an unfoldment of truth within my consciousness and I must expect it without any help from you then when I have found it I can share it with those who desire it with those who can open themselves to it but eventually they too must open their own consciousness individually and specifically and continuously to the operation of divine law within them 
Now, I want to repeat this. This does not mean that we have found a God that through our prayers or treatments will heal disease, sin, death, lack, or limitation. We have found in this work that a realization of God's presence reveals no sin, no disease, no discord, no lack or limitation in your experience. Now a thousand may fall at your left and ten thousand at your right, as it reminds us in the 91st Psalm, but it will not come nigh your dwelling place if you are abiding in this. And it is only in this way that ultimately the world itself can be saved from itself. Why? Because if in my individual experience I have found that God is a reality and that in entertaining God continuously in my consciousness the evils of life do not approach me, then some member of my family sees that, some friend of mine sees that, some business acquaintance, and the first thing you know I have a patient or a student. And then as I can demonstrate to them that a realization of God removes from them all of these human discords, or if not all, the vast majority of them, and certainly all of the major ones, then they too become a light, and someone notices that in them, and soon they too have a patient or a student. And so it has been in the experience of the infinite way, that beginning with one individual, it soon was realized and experienced by friends, and so it has spread in these years to cover a good deal geographically of the Protestant world. Now, there are things in the world that are of importance to you and to me. If you are a businessman, there must be what we will call good business, prosperous business, harmonious business. If you are an employer, there must be harmonious relationships with employees. If you are an employee, there must be harmonious relationships with employers. If you are a citizen of a free community, you have to be able to live in harmony with your neighbors and with the members of your nation. And so it becomes important that we find something that will bring these experiences of harmony into not only our fleshly lives so far as health is concerned, not only into our financial lives so far as economic abundance is concerned, but into every avenue of human relationship. The infinite way has demonstrated that that is a present possibility. It has brought harmony into capital and uh, labor relationships. It has brought harmony into family setups. It has brought harmony into community setups. It has brought harmony into the lives of individuals on the business plane, professional plane, on one plane after another. And the reason it does it is one, God, God becoming an actual reality in our experience becomes that which reveals the absence of discord. I hope I can make this clear to you, that in a realization of God, the discords and inharmonies of life 
begin to fade away. They may not all disappear in one day, but they do disappear. And uh, they not only disappear, but they lead us into green pastures. They lead us beside still waters. They make an entire new life for us. Paul summed it up in this way. I live, yet not I. Christ liveth in me. And that becomes an actual experience to you and to me where there is a presence within us that gives us our daily work to do and uh, establishes harmony in uh, the working out of our work, whether it's homework, whether it's store work, professional, or any other. I have witnessed this at work in uh, the religious world, in the medical world, in uh, the family world, in the commercial world. I have witnessed this great truth that when God was accepted as one, one presence, one power, without an opposite, without opposition, when God was accepted as the infinite and only, in that moment the so-called errors of sense began to drop away. Whereas, as long as we were battling uh, these discords of earth, we multiplied them. It's a strange thing. There is that principle in Scripture of not fighting evil, not fighting it, and not pulling up the weeds, but letting the tares and the wheat grow together. And then in their due time, the tares fall away. So it is with this. Without battling sin or sinful desires, without battling disease or laws of disease, without battling for our livelihood, if we can begin in any given moment of the day or night, it could be this minute, to relax in the realization God is one. Beside him, Father. So I have nothing to fear that mortal man can do to me. I have nothing to fear that a mortal condition can do to me. No weapon that is formed against me can prosper. Why? In him I live and move and have my being, and in him is eternality of life, immortality of being, perfection, harmony, completeness, wholeness. Well. Duality means two-ness. The duality that perpetuates our discords is the belief in good and evil. If you believe in God and devil, if you believe in a power of God and the power of evil which God can do something to, or if you believe in the immortal and the mortal, or if you believe in the philosophical terms good and evil, there you have the source of every discord that is in your experience. And the very moment that you accept, even if you accept it intellectually, even if you can only agree with your mind that it makes sense that God is one and God is all and God is infinite, therefore I do not have to fear what mortal man or mortal mind or mortal condition can do to me, if only you can accept that as an intellectual premise and hold to it consistently for a week or a month or six weeks or nine weeks, you will find that the hard shell of the errors in your experience are beginning to crumble. You will find that by a persistent holding to this truth in your consciousness, God is one, and beside him there is no other. God is the only power, therefore I do not have to fight the power of man, the power of beast, the power of condition, 
the power of circumstance. I accept God as infinite being. And you watch what a few weeks of a consistent holding to that truth will do for whatever hard crust of error is disturbing the harmony of your existence. It has been with us in our work over these years a demonstrable fact that God is. And if God is, what else matters? Do you really care for anything else on earth if you can be assured within yourself, I don't mean by me or by anybody else, I mean if you can receive an assurance within your own being that God is, would you ever again fear? Would you ever again doubt? Would you ever again feel that it was of any concern to you whether temporarily you were making your bed in hell or whether temporarily you were walking in the valley of the shadow of death? Why no? Whither shall I flee from thy spirit? Lo, if I make my bed in hell, thou art there. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art there. Now, to be very truthful, Everyone must face this. The great doubt in our hearts and souls is, is there really a God? Is there? I'd like to believe it. I'd love to believe it. But I haven't seen too much evidence of it. And sometimes I've even trusted it and it didn't come through. Most of the world, really and truly, while owing, owning to a belief in God, actually don't believe it because if they did they would lay down their armor they would lay down the locks on the doors they would lay down their protective medicines they would say if God is isn't that enough and that would be the answer to all life God is and that is enough 